Wonderful. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming. My name is Erwin Volder. I'm an economist with the European Blockchain Association. I have the pleasure of moderating this panel today with our same speakers. And the topic is essentially that from the Genesis block onwards, what really drove the inflows into the crypto sector from an institutional perspective, from a retail perspective? Um, what's the underlying ethos, the ontology of why this space has garnered so much interest over the past 10 to 15 years. And just to give you uh, a small a small tidbit, just from the last year alone, I mean, we're looking at around 1,247 blockchain deals um, or 88% growth, 25.2 billion global blockchain funding in 2021. In Europe, median deal size up from one to three million from 2015 to 2021. And uh, Europe deals reaching an all-time high in Q4 um, with around 560 million. So. On this continent, especially, it sometimes plays second fiddle to the United States, given its given its size. Um, we're still seeing considerable growth, and I will now pass it on to the uh, to the panelists to give you a short introduction, and then we can dive in. Thank you, Erwin. Um, Juan Jimenez or JJ here. I represent Alastria. I'm the CEO of Alastria, which is a blockchain organization based in, in Spain, but also working quite actively uh, in Europe, in the whole European region. Uh, building building networks and uh, building community, um, also touching on different sectorals that maybe I'll explain later on. I'm on also the uh, public policy director for Santander Group, where I take care of uh, digital regulation that is um, underway in the European Union. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Alexandre Kesch. I work for City Ventures, so it's the venture arm of Citibank. Um, doing investment, but also R&D and innovation in the space of uh, various topics related to fintech. My, in my specific team, we're focusing on blockchain and digital assets. And prior to that, I've been in the crypto industry uh, in Singapore, uh, running a crypto custody and prime brokerage service, uh, actually working from time to time with three hours in Celsius, who are in the, in the press uh, for the moment. But, uh, you know, that's the the beauty of crypto, you meet a lot of people. Sometimes uh, it leads to good things, sometimes it leads to bad things. And I guess we, we're going to discuss that as well a little bit. And I conclude this round for today. My name is Sarah Polarovic. I'm an executive director at the Digital Euro Association. Also topic, the Digital Euro, that's still uh, nascent, as you said. You mentioned the Genesis block. Down the line, we're still uh, three years, if we're lucky, or four years uh, from the Digital Euro being introduced. So uh, still lots to do here. And um, I'm also heavily involved with conceptualizing um, educational programs around blockchain and digital assets, um, and thus a topic that will foster education further down the line. Excellent. Now, what I wanted to start off with, and I think this is a really prevalent, uh, prevalent area, is the advent of the smart contract, you know, ERC-28s, 1404, 721, and there's a gamut of them. Realistically, how, tokeni how tokenization enabled by smart contracts has driven inflows and how programmability and composability has essentially revolutionized the game, so to speak, and what that has done to drive interest from an institutional level, from a category primitive level on the building side, uh, et cetera. From a, uh, I would decipher a bit uh, the different use cases and the different approaches, I think that when it comes to, um, to the power of blockchain, you know, the most attractive thing is, is, is the, the programmability itself. That's why most of the organizations adopted the technology. And this is the promise of automation and getting rid of reconciliations and also driven assets or behavioral, you know, providing behavior to assets is one of the most important features. And this is no secret. And I think we're in 2022. So maybe these ones, uh, this take uh, is, is already old. But this is why you know, the, the, the power of the technology seduced all the community, or most of the corporates and also SMEs that want to, put, want to tap new revenue sources and look also for efficiencies. So you, the, 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 uh, the programmability, as you mentioned, Erwin, is one of the, the main features. Of course, this drives you to the four use cases that we've seen in the ecosystem, in the, in the community. Tokenization, for sure, is one. Uh, and maybe we can elaborate more later on in something that we're, this gentleman here and myself, um, uh, we're working in a working group at a European level uh, that is called Tokenize Europe 2025 to look for how, how the tokenomics or token economics can change uh, dynamics here in Europe. 
Second one would be notarization, uh, how, how you can uh, register assets on a blockchain. And, uh, and uh, yeah, for sure, programmability, I think, is the, is the holy grail, is, uh, is something that, uh, that we're all looking at. And uh, certain constructs that we're looking at in, at the European Union, for example, Digital Euro, uh, we all, we all tr we're all trying to push for this programmability feature to be included into the construct. I'm going to be curious to see whether uh, your assumption about programmable, the digital euro being programmable, will become true or not. I hope to have another panel with you a couple of years from now. That will be great to see. Um, I want to maybe take a step back before we kind of get into smart contracts um, and then how far um, this has maybe helped blockchain to become the biggest sector in fintech as we currently see it. Since, um, well, smart contracts, of course, they give an entire new scope to um, digital service payments. So, and this is obviously what is going to be iterated here, right? So um, just um, digi digitalizing the payment process itself isn't enough anymore, but it's the money behind it. And this is of course what programmable payment takes to the next level in terms of not only tokenizing uh, money as exists today or as will exist tomorrow, but obviously taking it a step further and then saying, um, as we've seen now in China, it's actually used as a, as a voucher that's given to citizens that they can use in a certain way, um, spend with certain um, merchants um, in order to um, yeah, get the get economy um, back rolling after COVID hit, for example. Um, so these possibilities, I believe, um, are mostly also what drive smart contracts. And what's also another component that I deem important is um, that it's not just financial services. So of course, most people here, I mean, we have had a panel before us here about the healthcare system, um, but financial services um, and smart contracts is only one use case. And then you know, of course, I mean, I don't need to iterate all of these, but um, I mean, you can have uh, the, the minute of the, your favorite basketball game uh, tokenized, right? Via smart contracts these days. Um, that's not something, if we talk about other sectors in, uh, in fintech, such as uh, AI, for example, um, we don't see an equivalent um, of this magnitude, I don't think. Uh, and on the banking side, what uh, banks and the financial industry thinks, uh, finds exciting about uh, distributed ledger technology, blockchain, the progr programmability, the tokenization um, characteristics uh, of this technology is the fact that it's breaking silos. So when you look at the current financial and banking market, you have every type of instrument has its settlement infrastructure. You have RTGS system and ACH for payments. You have exchanges, CSDs for securities. There is a DVP process between the uh, delivery versus payment process between the two, but it's, a bit, it's not always easy uh, to uh, eliminate all risks, uh, for example. And, and being able to tokenize pretty much every type of assets on one platform and be able to swap those a assets from one uh, to the other, being able to um, move, uh, I would say, those assets in a 24-7 capability, uh, which does not exist today in the payments world and the securities world, is really what uh, uh, the financial market will be leveraging, I think, in this technology. So um, uh, the, the, the fact that standards are emerging, like ER, the ERC standards you, you mentioned or the uh, the VM uh, wallets uh, compatibility, for example, is, are good things because it's necessary. Uh, there are other things that will be needed in terms of s standards for the, uh, the mainstream adoption in the financial and capital market and banking markets uh, to happen. For example, uh, uh, the reuse of existing standards that, ex that are uh, used today in the, f in, the, in the banking and financial sector, like the ISO 20022 standards, which is a data layer that can be reused in any on any technology. The digital token identifier, which is a standard that has been issued recently to help ensure that you're always sure of the asset you're talking about and you don't uh, mix them up, uh, will also be uh, important. Uh, but we are uh, in a good di we're going in the right direction. Excellent. And what I also find really interesting is the fact that you can use this technology and the smart contracts and the traceability for tracking Antarctic whitefish populations or conflict minerals or for different kinds of provenance record, records as well. So it has that social characteristic that's, that's unique among other frontier technologies. And, and I think that brings me to my next point is crypto has a cult of personality around it. It's a, it's a subset of narrative economics es essentially. And what do you think ultimately differentiates it from, from AI or, or, or deep learning 
or other things. Why has it accrued such a cult of personality and has that contributed to the inflows that we see? If I can take this one, um, I would say other exponential technologies are more an evolution of old ones. For example, when, we, when you look at artificial intelligence, well, uh, this comes from the 80s. Uh, you look at the maths behind, the, the mathematical models are not that sophisticated. And uh, it's been an evolution, I would say. So we, we uh, human being, we, we, we learned to coexist with the technology and to implement it in our processes. And it's been more uh, progressive, I would say. Um, other exponential technologies are a little bit like these ones. When you, when you touch on, the, on exponential technologies, IoT, for example, well, it's, it's, uh, at the end of the day, sensors connected to oracles. It's not that sophisticated. I think uh, blockchain, when it came across 2008, came like you know, fresh air, and, you know, new, 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 new phenomenon that uh, was difficult to decipher. And of course, the first use case was about rebuilding the whole financial system, which is a quite an interesting chunk when it comes to, to, to move pieces and that change the course of, uh, of a history. And uh, over years, I think it became quite confrontational, you know, the crypto guys versus the blockchain guys. I think that it is no more like that, at least in Alastair, we're trying to build bridges and to, to, to position well, we can do crypto, of course, but we should do crypto attached to the regulation because this is a very important piece and at the end of the day, you have to protect investors. And uh, crypto is the perfect expression of blockchain. So I think it's two phenomena that, that live together, that are, you know, uh, that have to live together and have to coexist. And um, I think that the more we walk together and the more we can, we can, we can elaborate and collaborate together, we'll get faster out of this crypto winter that uh, I, I don't really like the term but it's out there and uh, I think that blockchain with crypto uh, has a long run uh, before uh, uh, to go further. So blockchain and, and, digital, and digital assets are one of the eight technologies that we think will shape the future uh, at CD. so of course IoT, uh, 5G, uh, AI etc are. I guess the difference between all those and blockchain and digital asset is that uh, blockchain and digital is assets, oh, no, the other ones are tools enabling other processes and other uh, activities to take place. Blockchain and digital asset is an activity in itself. It's actually a paradigm shift on how something that we have been doing for many, for, for centuries, meaning paying stuff and moving value around, uh, will be in the future. It's a, it's a complete paradig paradigm shift between what we know to do it today and a new future that uh, we don't even know how it will uh, end in terms of, um, of outcome, in terms of uh, new op uh, services, uh, new products that will be uh, emerging from that uh, new payment layer in a way. A and that's, I think, what makes it more exciting. Uh, generally, people are excited more by money than by uh, technology uh, itself. Here, it's actually marrying technology and money and, ma and value, rather, and making it um, uh, uh, and actually building and leading to the building of a new generation of internet uh, web 3 uh, that everybody at the end on the planet will, will, will be using. So I think that's the, the main difference between uh, 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 those technologies. I'm not sure I'm 100% uh, in line, but let me explain which points I mean. And I'll start off with Erwin's question, which was um, we see almost like a cult-like existence around or in the crypto community. And uh, quite simply put, honestly, I mean, we have the term Bitcoin evangelist. We talk about the orange pill that's infecting all of us by just taking it, um, turning us into a different human being. Um, I mean, I'm not sure Bitcoin maximalists would argue it's not their religion. Of course, not everyone, but um, I'm sure you'll find some out there, maybe here even out there. With the red eyes, the red eyes exactly. <laughs> on Twitter, if, if not here, then on Twitter, uh, certainly. Um, but I think, um, if, if, I mean, there's of course a reason as to why uh, that is the case. And um, one of them is of course that, um, I mean, what type of payment today provides you with the way of expressing your political views, right? That you think a financial system should be decentralized, for example. And uh, this is not necessarily something that we've seen before, not something that like a pattern detector such as AI can necessarily serve you with. I mean, I feel like that's more of a, of a um, 
of a, of a tech talk you can have um, in terms of, okay, are we going to go into um, machine learning? Are we going to do um, neural networks and so on? But there's not this, uh, this inherent philosophy behind it necessarily. Then the second point I wanted to make is um, touching on, um, on JJ's point um, that um, we uh, actually forgot what you, what you said regarding... The, the us on them? The, uh, the blockchain guys and the crypto guys, maybe? Oh, yeah, exactly. Together. Thank you. That was, that was it, basically. Yeah, that we see this, this uh, a bit of a war almost between Bitcoin maximalists versus um, cr other crypto projects and the entire um, discussion about what true decentralization uh, means and so on and how important it is to the community. And I do think it bears a lot of risks. And, uh, I mean, if you wanted to, to compare it to religion almost, um, it's almost like there, there's a bit of lack of proof for all of these things at this point. Still, I mean, it's a lot of talk about the potential. It's a lot of talk about uh, what will be in the future, what we what we think will happen. But can we actually plan everything out as we as we do, or do we trust in a lot of um, what we don't know but have questions about? Um, so yeah, that's that's certainly um, my my stance on uh, whether it's cult like or not. No, and I think all of you have touched on a very very important point: is that blockchain is a pass-through mechanism that links all of these other adjacent technologies together. Like for, for digital twins that can trigger machine-to-machine -machine payments, you could leverage an IoT sensor to get that done on the physical side, which would then link to the, to the digital twin in, in the ether. And they're complementary to each other with blockchain being the current. And then, I mean, it's true. Uh, you look at the Bitcoin maximalists and for them, you know, crypto is a, it's a cross section of counterculture radicalism and technological determinism. And then they're kind of somewhere in between, but the reality is a little more, a little more different. And whether it's an inflation hedge, um, that's also dependent on, is this an inflationary sputter or is this an inflationary sputter within a larger deflationary overhang? And that's also a question that we had, we can't have answered yet because crypto is just now for the first time coming to terms with a high rate environment. It grew up, it inculcated itself in a low interest rate environment. So it's a complete paradigm shift in that regard, which brings me to my next question. And that's extremely important given the, um, how am I going to put this, the unfortunate market conditions or the extreme market conditions that have impacted uh, 3AC and Babel and Celsius and a whole bunch of other issuers going back from Terra is that in this bear market, what do you think is absolutely necessary to preempt a regulatory push that we all know is coming? What can the community do to buffer itself and prepare for the next up cycle? Well, I, I would say, when, and you touched on, on regulation, regulation is very is very pretty much needed uh, in this in this specific moment uh, we know is in the oven um, um, we know that we've been we've been cooking this one uh, positioning positioning uh, the, the, the the industry uh, in front of regulators uh, core regulators in in Europe at least in my case I think they they understand perfectly that we need we need a framework the more clarity the more certainty we get the better we can rebuild uh, the, some parts of the ecosystem and uh, intensify some others that are still missing. Um, the main three regulations, and I think in the, in the, in the panels there, in the, in the big auditorium, it has been touched uh, uh, for a while this morning, has been the pilot regime. Pilot regime for capital markets is there, it's already published, is there for the community, for the industry, for the financial industry to use it. Uh, but it's mostly focused on uh, multilateral, multilateral trading facilities and uh, central, central clearing counterparts. Not that much to uh, 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 financial players, but still an interesting uh, 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 regulation. It's a pilot, it's not definitive, uh, it's for five years, but I think it's going to bring lots of new instruments into the market, which is uh, uh, very good news for the industry. Second one is MICA or MICA, uh, the, the Markets in Crypto Assets Act. It's part of the digital package of the European Union with the DORA. And this one is going to take a while. Why? Because of the custodial liability, which is one of the, one of the points that is still not clear. And it's going to prevent certain players to jump into the, into the ecosystem and for the custodians, the new custodians, to have a very, a very bad time when it comes to uh, uh, position themselves. And that's why we see more and more cust uh, custodians shifting to a, to a software provider rather than a regulated uh, custodian. 
uh, this one combined with the, with the ESG, with the E for ESG, the environmental piece of a proof of work and how we uh, uh, shift uh, consensus mechanisms from POV, POW to POS, proof of stake and layer twos. These ones is going to take a while. Uh, that's why um, maybe it's going to take to until 2023 and then 18 months to be uh, uh, enacted. It's a long, long time. Um, uh, so the regulation is there. Uh, the, the more, the merrier, but taken in a proper, uh, in, a, in a proper dose. And I think it's going to bring more and more clarity to the ecosystem. It's only good news. Yeah, I fully agree that uh, it's unavoidable, and I think it's a it's a good thing to have the right regulations put in place for uh, the industry that we are in. Uh, not to prevent innovation, but to protect consumers as simply as that, and to avoid this technology and those assets to be used for criminal activities like any value and assets can be used for those type of activities. So that's the base. Um, uh, but r what, I'm no what I've noticed really as a difference from when I was talking to regulators five years ago and now uh, talking to the same people is that they've learned a, a lot. They've educated themselves a lot uh, on the topic. Some of them are, are more knowledgeable, to be honest, than some crypto experts experts in the room uh, and I'm not pointing to anybody obviously it's a general statement a and that's a good that's a good news because they they slowly but surely getting that uh, trying to replicate or apply existing regulations to this new type of assets will not work so specific sets of regulations need to be put in place they also understand that um, uh, a, some they still don't understand actually how they will be dealing with DeFi, for example, because that's some, it's, it's, it's an industry that is complicated to regulate if it's fully decentralized, but, they, but they're not in a hurry to do that because they understand it's, it's early stage. Most regulators understand it's early stage. Most regulators understand that they need, uh, these uh, um, setups needs to prove uh, their characteristics of full decentralization. They need to, uh, 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 but, but, but they're also looking at the industry to organize it themselves, like CFI has been doing in the, five year, in, in the last five years. I think DeFi should now try to sit around and understand, okay, what will a regulated DeFi look like? What should it, l should it look like? And then go with their ideas to the regulators who are eager to learn and eager to talk and dialogue uh, with those uh, communities. I think the point you made about um, basically not just speaking about DeFi in their, let's say, in their own separated room um, is important in terms of actually get people that um, develop in DeFi and so on um, into the room to understand really what's needed. Otherwise, we're going to have another case of unhosted wallet ban in the EU, for example. Um, that's something we went through. And I think in general, we can say that everything that um, decentralized finance is going through right now, we have been through already in traditional finance. And we needed the equivalence of the Terra crash. We needed the equivalent of the Celsius network um, in traditional finance. Um, and we've seen those things uh, happen and then regulation appear afterwards. And unfortunately, we're going through with the exact same thing. Um, I think there's two things to do here. Like you said, basically um, get everybody at one table um, to find a suitable work in progress solution for the meantime until it is fully established, whatever that means. Um, um, but then uh, on the second hand, so if we're not talking about DeFi, if we're talking about um, e-money tokens, for example, and um, regulation where we already have um, a blueprint, let's say, from other uh, jurisdictions, actually look over um, there what works, what doesn't. I'm, I'm sometimes not sure in how far that's happening. Um, what do I mean by this? As an example, what happens if the EU bans um, unhosted wallets? Well, consumers aren't going to not have unhosted wallets. They're going to have other exchanges or... Um, or uh, move abroad, essentially, especially for startups, that's true, not necessarily for consumers themselves. Um, but um, what's also the responsibility, I think, in terms of if we say, okay, proof of work, um, the working mechanism um, is prohibited in the EU, that will put the, um, the responsibility of dealing with uh, Bitcoin and proof of work um, away from the EU and move it to other countries that don't have necessarily the security of being able to, or the privilege of thinking about things like which um, consensus mechanism do we still allow? How do we deal with this? Whereas the EU obviously um, 
besides the uh, Ukraine-Russia um, war, of course, taking place right now, um, but would be in a situation to think about do we give this uh, responsibility away to other countries um, or do, do we keep it? We somehow need to deal with it. But I do think that we're at a point where um, at least um, regulation around the world has realized um, Bitcoin is not going anywhere, DeFi is not going anywhere. We can't further ignore this. This is actually causing problems if we do. Wonderful. And you actually raised a really good point. Um, and I'd like to just extend that a little further. So, I mean, recently, uh, Christine Lagarde made some comments with respect to like a bespoke regulatory regime for unidentified uh, crypto assets that are originating from an unidentified issuer. So, I mean, that specifically looks at things like Bitcoin. And she's calling for a Mika 2, um, while the ink hasn't even been penned on Mika 1. Uh, what do you think of this? Is this symptomatic of the EU where, you know, in home improvement, you measure twice, cut once, we regulate twice, and then produce once? Do you think that that's something that's necessarily just talk at this point or do you do you feel that the EU might honestly move in this direction and already start thinking about additional regulatory umbrellas while this one isn't even penned yet I would say I would say that uh, uh, innovation goes faster than than regulation and uh, this is a bit cheesy already we all know that at least the ones here in the room um, we have to we have to welcome we have to uh, uh, show at least uh, a bit of, of respect about the effort they're making uh, uh, in Brussels and also in Frankfurt uh, when putting together a regulation that is not an easy one. It's, a, it's the fifth asset, it's a new asset. As Alexander was, 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 was mentioning, it's a, it's a total new activity in itself. It's not, a, it's not a technology that is kind of incremental. This is something totally new and uh, putting together a regulation from the ground up, from, from scratch, is, 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 very, is very difficult. At the same time, it has to be ambitious. So it has to be uh, uh, exhaustive and uh, has to embrace or, or at least touch on the, di on the different matters where investors are may maybe struggling, issuers are struggling, and uh, financial players are struggling. Uh, but I think that is a good advance. When it comes, for example, to DeFi, well, DeFi is not even touched in the in the in Mika wording uh, when when you when you read the full text, the full 500 pages. Um, it takes a while, you know, to, to read it, and uh, and uh, of course they go they go uh, with the first first attempt, uh, but I'm sure we'll have a Mika too, as we we enjoyed <laughs> uh, Mifid too. Uh, maybe maybe we're 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 uh, uh, in the in the journey of um, of, uh, of getting a Mifid three, and this is the course of uh, of the facts uh, in, in 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 regulation. But for now, I think that with a proper Mika touching properly on uh, sustainability provisions, also taking good care of custodial liability, and uh, not being that strict when it comes to unhosted wallets, uh, and also. <laughs> Uh, uh, taking it right when it comes to NFTs, only regulating the ones that are really a financial asset and not the others, not, not damaging the creator's ecosystem, I, I would say this could be a good take. Um, I, I agree with you uh, in that sense. I do think that uh, every regulation that will occur from now on will either be due to iterations of uh, Mika, at least in the EU, or it will come from another unfortunate um, piece of news, whatever the next uh, one might be. I mean, it's still 2022, and uh, we've already seen a couple of major uh, news arise within the last couple of weeks, in fact. Um, so let's see what's to come. Um, and I think they're going to go about it from a reactive perspective um, and then also adjust Mika according to what they see works and what doesn't. Um, if it all ends up being um, inside of Mika, um, I mean, I'm no expert on this topic in terms of does it have to be written in Mika? So do does the entire topic of unhosted wallets have to be within the Mika regulation or can it be a standalone um, uh, law, for example? Um, in that sense, um, I think that's uh, less important at that point. Um, but yeah, as I said, I think it's going to be more about the reactive way of going about it and revamping um, Mika as needed along the way. Um, I, I just want to share one example of a problem that has been solved, in my view, relatively smartly, uh, which relate to unhosted things. I don't know if you remember in uh, 
at the beginning of mobile phone, you could easily go in any shop and buy a SIM card with a, an anonymous SIM card and use it, and uh, you know, a prepaid SIM card and do whatever you want, including selling drugs, including doing criminal activities, including all those issues. And obviously, those anonymous SIM cards were welcomed by criminals because it's, it was one way to get an, uh, remain anonymous and doing threat phone calls, for example. But that has stopped at one point, at least in my country, I'm from uh, uh, Belgium and I guess it's a European law where now when you go by a, uh, an anonymous SIM card, you need, to you, need to leave your, to, you need to show your identification and the seller needs to have a, a photocopy of your identification linked to the SIM card number that you've taken. It's simple. It's not really killing privacy because uh, they're just keeping it in case they need uh, to do a, a, law, uh, a law enforcement investigation and then they can go to the shop and get an information about who bought that SIM card. But I think the same could be one solution for hardware wallets, for example, or, or uh, hardware wallets at least. For, of course, mobile wallets are a bit more complicated to put in place, but there are ways of being imaginative about uh, helping to, uh, well, avoid those, that those uh, feet, those tools that wallets are, are used for criminal activities, while at the same time enable, leaving the people who are good citizens use those amazing tools to connect to Web 3.0 uh, software and, and uh, offering in the, reason, uh, in the future or to connect to DeFi products. Excellent. And I can just say that uh, that working group that uh, this gentleman and I are uh, currently a part of, um, there's some EU officials that have uh, on the part of the uh, commission uh, initiated this with the Deutsche Bank and Verband and they're very proactive in terms of the way that they see the future of the space which gives uh, gives confidence to the idea that we in the end will move in the right direction. Um, so we have a, a little bit of time left over. I was just wondering whether uh, anybody in the audience perhaps had a question if that was okay with, uh, with all of you so sure, we could sure. field some questions from the crowd. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to ask, um, as it, it was mentioned about the whole uh, financial system redefining, so is there like currently a chance that it may um, uh, really happen in some like mid-term uh, future? Uh, with regards that uh, currently um, there is still no big progress here and uh, Bitcoin in fact uh, consider it as uh, just another risk on asset but not like something um, really different like at the moment so uh, what uh, your thoughts on that guys is it possible question is if 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 through this technology our yeah. favorite technology we can change the, the way financial system is built for the citizen is, or? Is it a chance that completely new uh, financial system being built uh, based on these technologies and probably replacing the um, existing one or probably making the ex existing one something uh, supplementary? Because currently uh, like something vice versa happens. Well, it's, it is there in my view, but it's used by a small number of people, but it's still hundreds of millions of people. Huh? It's not small in the sense of small, and it's increasing every, every year. So I'm talking about people using Bitcoin as a store of value, people using uh, different types of assets uh, on DeFi protocols to get, lend to get loans, stable coins, which are uh, used extensively. Uh, I use them for cross-border transfers from time to time because it's more efficient. So uh, it, it is being used, but it's not uh, the, the challenge of this industry is user experience. Uh, the user experience is pretty shit, to be honest. It's uh, managing a, 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 a wallet yourself, managing your private keys is a bit complicated. So uh, most people need, and including myself, to rely on uh, in intermediaries, uh, which is not bad, by the way. Uh, it's just it, it, if it hides the complexity of, of the of the. The, the product behind, why not? And it, and it will be likely the future. So the, the, in my view, the future will be 
uh, not only DeFi, it will be CeFi, DeFi, TradFi, coexisting together depending on the use case. One will be taking over uh, some of the process in TradeFi because it's more efficient. Uh, in other cases, it won't be the case because uh, TradeFi is more efficient. So it's really, the, uh, it's going to be, I think, the future, at least for the next 10 years, will be, uh, if not 20, it will be a mix of all types of Phi, uh, CFI, DeFi, TradeFi. I heard a new acronym uh, today, DCFI. Uh, why not? Yeah. You know, C D C Phi next time. Uh, so, um, uh, but but it's already there, and, and it's effectively working for many people in uh, in uh, emerging markets, for example, to do activities that they cannot do via the traditional financial market, financial industry. Um, and if I may add, I think this was the p perfect uh, caveat because I'm gonna go a bit into another direction uh, that will show, I think, I, ho I hope. Um, a bit of the other picture as well, because if we're just looking at DeFi right now, um, I totally understand if arguing with figures right now, you're not convinced that this will ever reach mass adoption, and uh, that's not necessarily my, my opinion uh, either, or um, at least not right now. Um, but what I don't think is uh, spoken enough uh, quite that much is what's happening besides that, right? So we see central banks actually looking into digital currencies because of Bitcoin. Um, because of blockchain technology, essentially. We see um, the um, regulated liability network where all of a sudden we see commercial bank money um, deposits um, as well as um, central bank uh, money and e-money um, being, being tokenized and thus having a couple of those benefits that um, blockchain or DeFi projects can offer move into more conservative realms. And these are all things that wouldn't be happening if it weren't for um, Bitcoin and DeFi and everything that's happening around it um, as, a, as a needed almost reaction to the developments of Bitcoin and blockchain to not, um, to not um, endanger the financial stability of a country or a currency unit per se. Hi guys, uh, thank you very much for all this uh, insight. Um, I'm Robin Deco, the co-founder of Equito, and we had to deal with, uh, with the problem that you mentioned, uh, which are the, the, the authentication of the investors uh, through all this DeFi and CFI process. Um, the STO framework is now uh, requiring uh, automated KYC for every user. You were mentioning the, the, the example of, of the, the mobile phone that we could purchase back in the days uh, without giving our IDs. Do you see the, the, the ID attached, ID powered by blockchain or powered by centralized uh, entities uh, attached to wallets uh, becoming a norm uh, in order for, for the regulator to be able to track uh, whoever old uh, assets? Or we will still have a gray zone in the coming years on, on ledger, uh, like hard wallet, for example? I would say, yeah, for sure. Uh, we, we, have, we have these other dossier in Europe, the EIDAS2, uh, that is dealing with uh, digital identity. Yeah. And uh, we know for a fact that it's going to be on a wallet. What we don't know is that it's going to, if, it's, if it's going to be blockchain based or not. And this is something that we're asking uh, to the regulators to be specific because the wording goes like uh, electronic ledgers, but not distributed ledgers, so it can be different. But what we know also is that uh, the European Union is pursuing adoption, and in order to do that, they're going to attach payment functionalities within the, ident the identity wallet, and potentially, the digital euro will come on top. This way, you have this layer, layer, layer of functionality, and when you're dealing with the finance of the people, this is where you get adoption. And, uh, but you have your identity underneath, and it's very powerful. Uh, not only who you are, is the 360 degrees of, of the whole profile of the user, and um, you'll be sovereign to share certain data with certain uh, um, uh, providers or, or partners around the ecosystem, or not. Which nowadays is not that easy. As we know, data is in the hands of uh, the Google, the Amazon, the Facebook, the Apples, uh, uh, the banks, the incumbents, we, I can follow, uh, and this belongs to the people. Um, so I think for sure we'll, we'll, we'll witness it. Um, this, one, this one is not in trialogue, so it's still not being discussed that much, but I will have in a year time or something, we'll have already an APP with us 
to deal with the public sector and the private sector together. At least in the 27 member states, there will be a common rail, a common infrastructure, maybe different expressions through different apps, but for sure interoperable each other. And to uh, actually to complement uh, the, the answer to your questions, will it happen? I think uh, having a digital ID uh, that f works and that is interoperable and that really is global, at least in, a, in I, at least regional, will accelerate also the adoption of all those DeFi and, and, and CFI services because it will solve um, one of the issues uh, that, that exists today in this in this industry is is knowing your counterparty and knowing and making sure that when you transfer assets from one address to the address to another address, you're not sending to the wrong address as well. So it's also linking an ID to an address is also a positive thing in a sense that it helps you making sure you're not doing a mistake uh, when, you, when doing transaction. I just, I just wanted to add that, you know, when you're looking at privacy, um, and we've had this talk as well, you always come to the trilemma of privacy, scalability, and, and civil resistance, and that's also something that needs to be taken into account, provided you go that direction. Uh, and it depends on the product which weighted average do you place on privacy, scalability, or civil resistance? And that's not something that's currently being exactly uh, dealt with, particularly because it's, it's the Triffin dilemma of blockchain. So that's currently where we are. But the team that's working on AIDAS2 is, is very, uh, very bright and capable. So I'm sure that uh, we'll definitely have, as uh, JJ said, more information within the next year. Um. Thank you uh, for sharing your views. So I have a question regarding in terms of investment itself. So we see a lot of countries around the world are becoming skeptical about cryptocurrencies and that it might or might not lead to dollarization or Ill illegal activities going on in the economy. This said that regulations are tightening in a lot of emerging markets. So do you see that this would uh, discourage the sector and even the adoption of uh, uh, decentralized finance in a lot of these countries and making it go mainstream. Uh, and the second question regarding the same, if the companies do adapt to the new regulations, then the whole uh, concept of decentralization kind of goes away and everything becomes centralized or the information is given out to the government or is made, uh, you know, is shared with the organization. So how do you see this dichotomy playing out that if you have centralization, then government uh, decentralization then government discourage it and if it becomes centralized then uh, the whole meaning of decentralization goes away um i can attend to the to the first question at least a little bit i hope um this is obviously very complex uh, and going beyond crypto i mean the entire um topic of over dollarization um in those terms well that's of course uh a problem in, in this far as we see um, the uh, U.S. stablecoin or stablecoins in general that are um, backed by um, the U.S. dollar um, to be very, 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 very dominant. And this, of course, has in first priority to do with regulation. Um, so certainly um, this is something that um, the lack of or <laughs> the too much regulation in other countries is, is, uh, is driving and causing and uh, causing problems again, right? I mean, El Salvador used to be um, dependent on the U.S. dollar now, it, I mean, they they still have the U.S. dollar, and now they also have crypto. Um, but it, uh, the the risk is certainly there. Um, I'm not sure how to solve this. Uh, again, I think it has to do with more countries um, allowing um, stable coins to be issued and not have such high entry barriers. Yeah. And maybe on the decentralization versus centralization, um, I I I, th I know a lot of people are looking forward to have everything fully decentralized and everything fully managed by individuals in charge of their, va their, their wealth and, 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 their, and their future. But we all know that it's not going to be like that. There is no ideal world that is uh, uh, all, uh, taking place. It's always, uh, it always ends up being a compromise between uh, various uh, interests, in this case regulators, for example, versus users versus service providers. And to conclude, I would say that uh, the, the, the future will likely be a mix of solutions, some being able to be pretty much fully decentralized because they don't raise any risks, at least perceived risk for the regulators, and others having to be a bit more centralized because uh, there is a, a, a bigger risk concern. That's, that would be my guess, but I don't think we'll reach, our, uh, reach a fully decentralized 
uh, world in the, in the future. Okay, excellent. And uh, that was our panel. Thank you very much for attending. If you have any other questions, um, feel free to reach out afterwards. And we can discuss. <laughs> Thank you to the, uh, to the great panelists. <laughs>